Hi Class T, here we are, it's Friday and we are ready for Chapter 5. Luke and Scott have been true to their word and taught us new tricks. We met every day after school and Luke sets up a new slalom course or a new ramp to practice jumps and turns. I can't wait for the summer holidays when we can come and spend all day here. Asha is always quicker to pick up the tricks than me. She's the one to race Luke down the track and beat him on the slalom. And you said girls can't skate, she says, after she wins another race against him. Scott smirks at Luke. Nan would kill you if she knew what you'd said that. Luke grins. Don't tell her. I haven't seen their Nan for ages. I remember her at school play sitting at the back. She was a small, fiery woman with dyed black hair and bright blue eyes. She used to teach swimming at the local pool too. She was a national swimmer, says Scott. Missed the Olympic team because of injury, says Luke. I can hear the pride in their voices for their small, fierce nan. Asha sits on the ground and crosses her legs. I haven't seen her at the pool. Does she still swim? Scott frowns. He picks up some weeds and curls the stems around his fingers. She's not been well. What do you mean, Asher asks. Come on, says Luke, as he walks to the top of the ramp again. Let's have another race. I watch Luke. I'd never really noticed it before. But now I see how Luke always protects Scott. He changes the conversation or takes the taunts and insults. Luke fights the world and Scott just shrinks away from it. I sit with Scott and watch Asher and Luke race each other down the ramp. I'm sorry to hear your nan's ill, I say. Scott picks up a stone and scratches the point of it into the ground. If she gets really sick, we won't be allowed to live with her. Can't you live with your mum? I ask. Scott scratches the stone deeper and makes long score marks in the ground. She wants us to. He flings the stone across the building. But Nan says our mum can't look after herself at the moment, so she won't be able to look after us. What'll you do? I say. Scott shrugs and turns his head away from me. It seems that the wolf is listening too. He pads slow, softly closer and lies down in the dirt near to us. Scott reaches out and the wolf crawls closer and pushes his nose into Scott's hand. I should tell stop, Scott to stop, but Scott and the wolf seem to trust each other. Maybe they see something in themselves of themselves in each other. People don't like wolves, Scott says. His fingers trace along the soft fur of the wolf's nose. They think they're terrible. The wolf moves closer and rolls onto his back so that Scott can scratch his belly. He seems more like a dog today. I reckon he's run away, says Scott. I reckon he's run away from somewhere bad and found that it's just as bad here. He's got no one. He's got us, I say. Scott looks at me and smiles. For a moment, it lights up his face. Yeah, he says. He's got us. We'll come every day, I say. Every day, says Scott. We join the others, but I turn to look back at the wolf. He's watching us with his golden eyes. I hate leaving him. As we turn the corner, we hear a sound. A wild cry that belongs to some place far from here. It starts off softly and gets louder. It echoes in the air. It's a wolf howl. And it goes right through me. I feel it deep inside. We all stop and listen. I can tell the others feel it too. It's a wild call, try, tying us together somehow, wrapping around all of us. Jakob answers first. 
then we all do. We raise our voices and howl back. We are now part of each other, part of the same pack. Each day, I look forward to going to Wolfland. We listen out for the wolf's call when he hears us. Then our own howls mix with his in this metal and concrete landscape. It feels as if we change in the moment we slip under the wire fence. It's as if we leave our normal selves behind and become wolves. Wolfland is our territory and no one can touch us here. It's our freedom. I haven't seen Connor as happy as he is here for a long time. Connor and Jakob have made a huge map of Wolfland. Connor doesn't draw dinosaurs now. Instead, he draws all the living things he finds here. He fills his notebook with animals and plants. His beetle pictures are the best. He found ten different types. He draws in all the little details like fine hairs on a beetle's leg. Scott showed him how to shade the pictures so that they look 3D. Connor looked so proud when Scott told him he could be a proper artist one day. Jakob has a notebook too, and he fills that with cartoons of an action hero he calls Wolfman. The hours fly by as Connor and Jakob poke under stones and scramble through the bushes. This is our place now. Scott opens up his bag and pulls out spray paint and a stencil. What's that for? Asher asks. It's our sign, he says. I watch him spray the black paint over the stencil, and when he pulls it away, a wolf head is left printed on the ground. We could get into trouble for that, says Asher. Luke shrugs. It's not like it matters. Nobody cares about this place. Nobody else comes here. But he's spoken too soon. Maybe this place was too perfect to last. Connor and Jacob come running into the building. Hide, says Connor. There are people out there. We duck down and keep our heads low. I lift my head to look. Outside in the sunlight, I see three men with hard hats. Did they see you? I whisper. Dunno, said Connor. Connor looks like he's about to cry. I left my bag out there. We watch as one of the men bends down and picks up Connor's bag. He looks around as if trying to see who left the bag there. He then pulls out Connor's notebook. He turns the page slowly, looking at all the drawings. The other two men have moved on. One is pointing to the river and then to the steel frames of the gas tanks. But the man with the notebook stays behind. He takes photos of the pages with his phone. Who do you think they are? says Asha. I sink down and put my head in my hands. I bet they're the ones that want to buy this place and turn it into shops and offices. They're going, whispers Connor. I hear the jangle of chains, then the rev of an engine as a car pulls away. Connor runs to grab his book. He turns it over and over as if he can't believe he's got it back. It's all here, he says. I look at the book. I see that Connor's written Wolfland on the front and put his name and address there too. I feel sick inside. The man knows who we are. Luke picks up his skateboard. I bet they'll come back. Might as well make the most of it here while we can. We practice our moves, but it feels different now. Not as good. The wolf is restless too as the new smells of other humans have made him feel twitchy. He curls up in his bed, his nose in his fur, but his eyes watch our every move. By the time we leave, black clouds hang low over the city. Thunder rumbles in the distance. A storm is on the way. Maybe the wolf feels it too.
because this time, when we leave, his cry sounds wild and high, as if in pain. We slip home beneath a dark and stormy sky, and it feels as if everything is about to change. That's it for chapter five today. Don't forget, if you want to submit your own pictures to be used on next week's chapters, then please get them to me by midday today, and then I'll be able to use them um, in next week's videos, which are being recorded um, potentially on Friday and over the weekend. Stay safe and keep washing those hands.